Welcome back to Wook Plus. I'm Weekend Wook, joined by Kev and T. What's up, guys? Happy Wook Plus. Get, later. See if we can pop for that. Oh, for my yeah, it was spot on, wasn't it? All right, ticket master. Oh, we're gonna jump right into it. We're no, no, <laughs> how no, you I'm doing? Just, I'm, I'm just, Goddamn, I'm, Kev. I'm, no, no, I I'm just for two weeks. I come back on it. So how no, no, no. Doing? It, All right. it was it was just me looking at it and, and mumbling out loud and sighing heavily. And I did it out loud and didn't mean to. <laughs> how was and your week off? And yourself how mentally your, prepared. Right. How was your week oh, off? Tickets. Oh, it was good. I had a little procedure, but I'm the healthy, clean bill of health. So I'm feeling good. I uh, I missed you guys. Though. I, I, I couldn't watch. I mean, I'm sure you guys did great. And I will go back and watch. But I was just... I was like really uh, missing it. I wish I, I wish I could have been here. But did you guys do all right without me? You got fun. It's a good cool. show. Yeah we, did, yeah, we did good. We were all over the place with our show, but we were very uh, stream of consciousness. But we hit like twenty different topics. It was good. we had fun. That was fun. I mean, we covered a lot of ground and just kind of went. That was that was a blast. Yeah, those are the best. I love our yeah. set list, and like I'm, I'm, I think that's the right way to do it. But I do miss those shows. Like the lots we used to do, where we're just like fucking, we just go. And you know what I mean? It'd be like fifty different tangents. So you have no idea where you're gonna end up, and and you just and get I mean, there. It, it went really fast. At one point, we were like thirty-seven minutes in, and we we're like, oh, I guess we should do the halftime now. Like we were flying. It just it, it was really it was well. It was it was a lot of fun. It was good. We missed you though, but it was fun. I missed Kev triggering me too. I actually <laughs> built that in as siege. We have it towards the end. Uh, I actually have. I want to get Kev's riff take, and we can we can see how successful he is at triggering the shit out of me. But <laughs> I got to keep my my blood pressure down, so we'll do that towards the end of the show. <laughs> um, yeah, real quick, I guess we'll get some housekeeping out of the way up front. Uh, we have Goose this Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We'll be doing after shows. We also have a 2000 show for Wook Club. We're gonna be listening to Merryweather. 2000s so that'll be wood club tuesday night uh so if you're not watching goose you can watch that live will be back next wednesday again that will also be during goose so you know if you're not watching goose you can come and tune in for that uh and then we'll be back sunday morning with another sunday morning uh, and there will be else? no oh, and then there Kev be... did the disco biscuits thing today so if you haven't checked that out him and greg uh did a cool little microdose on disco biscuits so that was cool no no. I mean, no. Tim can. Tim can come hang with you guys if you want, but I'm glad you gave me the permission. But I, I heard that the streams were free, though, right? Is this true? Fucking brilliant marketing. Whether or not you like that band, thank their you, choice, Their choice. Everything, everything they do that has to do with content and distribution and stuff is genius. Like I can't get over. I, I just keep wanting to give them the benefit of the doubt. I don't still haven't really gotten into them and their music, but everything else they do on a marketing and, and production and content side, I am the biggest fan of. I love it. Like I think Ben Gate it. could have taken down a lot of bands in their position or at least not like completely taking them down, but ho ho hobbled them or tarnished them. Like, you know what I mean? Taking a little of the, the luster off. But they're, I feel like, slingshotting right now What and taking it and using it for momentum. This whole thing with the cap and Kat's new band and all of the, the Chateau sessions. And yeah. I don't know. Did you see their, uh, and they even have a sense of humor at themselves. Their April Fool's Day joke was, <laughs> some people didn't appreciate it, but I thought it was brilliant. Like, it just speaks to who they are and what they are. Like, it's great. I mean, good right. for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll talk about Ben, too. He's doing all right. He's got a new gig. But uh, let's talk about this fluff piece that Live Nation posted. This is the craziest shit. So at first I thought it was live for live music because I just saw the LIV in the URL. And I was right. like, that's weird that they're doing this puff piece. And then I realized that it was like a corporate post. Kev, did you find that? Who who brought this? T link found in? this. T came across this one. I came it across it on, on Twitter today. I think uh, maybe it was fan art or image. Someone, somebody had posted it. And I was like, oh, this is interesting because they had made a comment that it was a funny, like interesting of them to post this or whatever. So I wanted to take a look and read it. I didn't think much of it until I started getting into it. And I started reading it. And the more I read it, I was like, is this just a massive PR piece saying, is this like, the it's, not us. it's not our fault. Blame the bands. Blame the artists. Blame their management. Like, we don't get 
apparently Ticketmaster is making no money and Live Nation's making a very small amount of money as the um promoter. Uh, yeah, there's a promoter. But they but they're also a venue. They have a lot of subsidiaries that own most of the venues. And it's funny because in the piece, they're like, it's the venue's fault. And then like, oh, by the way, we own most we of own the venue. venue. <laughs> right. So I'm you curious know? to who they're actually negotiating with, like themselves, basically, is what it sounds like. Because there's a lot of like back and forth between, you know, what they say, like they look at a lot of research. And then through that, we talk about like the fairest price and what's the fairest percentage to take out as a promoter. And if you promise a band, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, are we going to make you know, 10,000 of that back for us or whatever. And I don't know, you read it and you're just like, it's a corporate shill. <laughs> like yeah, it's, it's just it's the biggest PR bullshit piece. I mean, there's some good points in it, but it's hard. There's also a lot of terrible points and a lot of misleading, but it's hard to take any of it seriously because first of all, what's fact check. Like they lay out a lot of percentages, but it's not like a fucking journalist doing percentages. It's like it's them. A, a corporate man giving you the percentages. Um, right. And then also, I feel like they're like trying to focus on this is one problem that some people have. So we're trying to just disguise everything else. But it's not just specifically junk fees or the monopoly of like the big costs, right? It's also ran horribly, right? Like on sales are always crashing. The scalpers and bots, there's been like nothing done to stop that. And they benefit from that. And they don't right. even talk about the platinum stuff in it either. They totally, they didn't even bring up any of that. And I'll tell you one thing that really made me mad was the end. It says statements to the effect that Live Nation and Ticketmaster keep ticket prices high are just flat wrong. Anyone with basic understanding of the industry knows this. And those who perpetrate this falsehood are cynical at best. They do a disservice to customers and to, yeah. and to the rational political mm -hmm. discourse. Basically, they're saying, fuck you if you think we're ripping right. you off, even though we are. Like it's well, so, well, it's it's like it's such a dick thing to say when you're trying to like defend yourself and be like, oh no, we're the good guys. They don't here, have we you. don't have to like them because they have a monopoly. That's what they're saying. Like we're a monopoly, so fuck you guys. Yeah, it's well, so my, bad. my thing. My thing is they go through all the fees and they justify the fees by saying this person needs their cut in the '90s, the '70s, the '80s. In the when we used to buy tickets, T. It was the price of the ticket, and the only fee you ever saw was a two fifty parking fee, or something if like that. that. So something, where we're all, yeah. it was all built in at the time, right? And, and I always remember in Colorado, like every Red Rock show I saw, it was Barry Fay, Fay Productions, <laughs> like Fay concerts, and on the commercials, it was always like you know, Reggae on the Rocks this summer brought to you by Fay concerts, and he was the promoter for everything. And then he ended up as he got older, sold his business out, and like was no longer the promoter mm -hmm. for. The venues in Colorado, and then that's when you started seeing all these changes start happening with who was making the money off of the promoters' deals and stuff. And it just—I mean, we've always talked about the music industry is fucked from top to bottom, right? Like, I mean, with Napster and just the way artists get paid. And in the article, it does talk about how you know that used to be—you used to make the money off of tours because you had new albums and stuff, and now it's a little harder because bands are so much different with how they make money without touring and stuff. So. It's interesting, but man, it's just, it's brutal. And they do nothing to talk about the secondary market either, which I feel like they set up by a lot of this because what really brought this up was the other day, my sister-in-law is looking for tickets for Olivia Rodrigo at MSG this weekend on Friday night. And I posted that for two tickets, it's over four grand in section 119, which yeah, is like our crazy. favorite section, $2,000 a person. So like, you know, sometimes you buy a ticket and you're like, I'm going to buy two tickets and take a buddy or like my wife or my girlfriend. Four grand to take a friend, like for what? One How, for one night of a show. I think that's for what like I paid for the Baker's of... dozen. Like, I think I, I literally I didn't got understand. And her age that. group is not like working class people, right? Like, it's a mom having to take their daughter or like high school, college mm -hmm. students who don't have two thousand dollars to spend on a concert. Dad like, does though. Crazy. They're hoping that the dad on Long Island, yeah, they want is, the wants his little princess yuppie. to go and. Well, that's the problem, though. Not everybody has that, so you're alienating half of your fan group right there, and it's just it's insane. It's insane. It's I, just, I tell it, you it, what I, I found really interesting about the timing of this article. Last week in Congress, there was a report released that said the Ticketmaster and Live Nation were engaged in kickbacks and payola, and they sometimes got a hundred percent of money collected from vendors because yeah. they let the vendor come into the venue and sell stuff, and mm -hmm. it, it was it was so shady that I I'd be surprised if there wasn't a court case. Like Department of Justice comes after him for well, this. 
this is all based around the antitrust things, right? Like the whole yeah. reason this propaganda is specifically aimed at trying to defend themselves against the antitrust. But th that's a good point, Kev. The, is it's on paper there is like, hey, this money goes to the band, this goes to the venue, and it seems very siloed and clean. But I, it's not right. Like yeah. there's there's a lot it's of more money like a sewer. A it's more like a sewer <laughs> than a silo, right? It just, it, I mean, just talking about it fires me up so much. It's so wrong. Like the shit we have to go. And what you said earlier, Tim, about it gets one thing, the prices and everything, but the other part is the fiasco and the anxiety and the pain in the ass it is to even try and get online and Don't get in the bother. waiting room and try and buy your ticket online. And then by the time you get in there, they're all gone. And even if you're trying to do like artist pre-sale or venue pre-sales, the tickets are so selective that even then, by the time you get in there, most of the good ones are gone. So then you're like, okay, I'll wait for the on sale date. And then you try that and it's just it's insanity. Like it's, it's just, you, you, there's a, there's a whole psychology. I've read an article on this Ooh. about making you wait mm -hmm. about like had taking the tickets away at the last second. That's planned because your instinct is to grab whatever's there and then you'll spend the $4,000 and then have buyer's remorse later, but they already have your money. Right. Yeah. And then if you can't go, the what's funny to me is, too, whenever I have tickets that I've paid X amount of dollars for, and then I'm like, oh, I can't go. I'll try and sell these and make my money back or maybe a small profit. I always end up losing money. Where are the people that are actually making the money off oh. of reselling the tickets? Like, I'm not one of those people. I always get screwed when I try to resell them anyway. Or I'm just got, like a nice I, guy that's like, fuck it, I'll just miracle somebody. But it, yeah, I the canceled miracle. New Year's, the canceled New Year's in 21, yeah. Right, a couple hours before <clears throat> I heard they were going to move it, that there were the all best. these tickets on StubHub $200 for four day passes. So I bought two four day passes. A couple hours later, when they announced the movement, the guy didn't want to send them to me. And yeah. StubHub, like, fined him or for whatever and gave me better seats for my $400. And then I turned around and sold the ones I had for face value that were up under the hang i would that have been, was one of the know. greatest moves we ever made like when we knew that they weren't going to do it i jumped on seat geek and bought those new year's eve tickets for like half the price and then like you said like two days later when they the april, april shows, shows right yeah. yeah and then the april shows got announced and those prices and all those poor people had sold it like that was yes that was one of the better moves i felt like we ever granted we ended up screwing over fans because they didn't know and not oh I, I i screwed over a scalper i'm pretty sure i screwed right over you did a right scalper. right yeah. right i ended up screwing over a fan who didn't know you know so you feel kind of bad <laughs> about that but it's like at the same time you finally felt like i like won, the bag I won of weed. <laughs> like that bag of weed that time huh let me uh exactly. let me ask you guys a question exactly let me Karma let me ask you a question do you do you guys think that this article was successful with anyone because no. when i read like i wasn't thinking about live nation or Ticketmaster right now and usually i have little like flashes in the pan when i get you know screwed on a non-sale i get angry and then i forget about it and now in the beginning of april when I, for no other reason they post this shit and now i'm like fuck you guys again and i'm wondering how much of it was a like a reverse of what their intention was do you think anyone read that and was like oh he has a good point is are there some <laughs> big <laughs> ones sales are, are there some big ones sales coming up maybe they're trying to just grease people ease them back in to try and no, one well, more it's, time the timing's because of the antitrust thing i think there's yeah i think congress is making moves i think it didn't aoc after the whole the taylor swift thing last year started like put that on her agenda and has been like ripping through i don't know it, that it, I don't sure of. That might be speculation. But to your point, Tim, it's true. Like I don't think anybody read that and like got done reading. Was like, God, I feel bad for Ticketmaster. I've been like, wrong. I've been so I wrong. Start, I should. They've only I made five percent on multi billions of dollars this past year. And by God, the way, I, like what the fuck? They, they're like, oh, we're promoting. We have all this delivery thing, but then it's supply and demand, and it's like literally cannot sell them fast enough. Oh, and it's all automated through shitty technology, <laughs> right? It's and, not, what did you, you're not even getting going to yeah and you're not even getting a physical ticket anymore and yet they're saying that's part of the problem like oh we have to we have to make sure they that charge you a fee for it they charge like, you a fee for sure. not having a ticket right and they're like we have to make sure it works electronically and the venue is set up right to receive your tickets and it's safer for you and you're like this is the venues we own <laughs> uh, yeah they're uh, like uh, yeah they're baby. crazy i don't know i'm kind of i think i'm over talking about it you guys want to People yeah, I want, to get back to, I want to get back to better times when we had rock posters all yeah. over. Well, we're we're in a golden age of rock posters now, I guess. But 
San Francisco in the late sixties was. Yeah. I mean, those were, and that was part of the excitement of the, like the, the whole thing. Right. Like, I mean, even the, the, my fish thing from, you know, the Europe tour is so much fun, like such a fun little, cause it wasn't a real poster. It's like one of the right. wall ad things, but yeah, well, I mean, set it's us just, up. Explain what this is. This tribute project. Somebody give because well, don't Stanley assume Mouse, everybody watching knows what the fuck right. we're talking about. Stanley Mouse was a poster artist. Um, most famous is probably the Skull and Roses album from the Grateful Dead. But he did many of those San Francisco a lot of psychedelia in the sixties. Yeah. Um, he's been sick, and there are a bunch of bands got together and are doing a tribute album for him and uh who's on i was reading that there's gonna be some dead stuff. leftover yeah leftover salmon chuck laval um the tex-mex experience if you've never heard them sean sham it's pretty good it's uh the guy's son uh from the pharaohs whatever yeah that band was called nikki blum and the gamblers are going to be on it dan lebowitz jason crosby the pimps of joy time which is a guy brian J, a a guitarist band fantastic well, and what was um, the music didn't they list what some of the the music they were going to be playing um i did not see that who's doing the album art <laughs> <laughs> let me see if i can look pull it up right, it did, all i saw was that it though all the songs were pulled from bands featured in his work yeah but then mm -hmm. i saw something that listed what those bands were that they're going to be pulling oh. i think it was like like a um Fuck, oh, Journey know. Cream. I see Journey Cream, The Beatles, Big Brother, Bo Diddley, right. Sir Douglas, mm -hmm. Moby Grape. If, have you guys ever listened to Moby Grape? No. Moby Maybe. Grape was... Skip Spence was the drummer in The Airplane. He left and started Moby Grape as a guitarist. And they were fantastic. They were poised to be this huge band. So the record company had the bright idea to release seven 45s on the same day. So nobody knew what to buy, and <laughs> they never caught on. It just like ruined their career. I'm like, what idiot releases seven forty fives on the same day? <laughs> they were I ahead of their time with the double albums. It was a yeah. but the, the sept album. Right? Right. <laughs> like, I'm, insane. I'm looking so, forward to this. Though. I'm looking. They, nothing ever happened. Really cool uh, Skip Spence went crazy. <laughs> Easy. T, is that me or Kev? I think it was Kev, but I'm not sure. I think it was yeah. Kev. Yeah. A little. <laughs> I always, I'm glad it's not me. That's all. <laughs> uh, and the album's going to be called The Mouse That Rocked. Ah, nice. Thank you. All right, you're back. He's back. <laughs> all right, T, why don't you uh, tell us about this Jazz Sabbath project? Sabah, oh, man. Sabbath. Sabbath. <laughs> there are yeah. two B's in it, like Black Sabbath. But I know it's so funny. I it's funny because last night I was actually on their website just tooling around, thinking like, God, oh, man, when are they gonna? Are they touring again? Like, what's going on? Because they just did a big European tour, and then they announced some Australian dates that they're going down to Australia. And then this morning I woke up, and there were two LA dates that just came out this morning. So I immediately went online and bought my tickets. But they are basically it's an English jazz trio. They have this whole fictional backstory with them. They're actually created by Adam Wakeman, who is the keyboardist and guitar player for Sabbath from 04 to, to 2017, and then also an Aussie band member from 04 to now. And basically, they just play renditions of Sabbath songs as a trio, as a jazz trio. And the idea came about in 2013 when they had a night off in Berlin, and Adam and one of their security guards were sitting at the hotel bar like late night, early morning. And the security guard asked Adam if he could play any Sabbath on the piano. And he was like, yeah, that'd be fun. So he sat down and played Sabbath songs on the piano until the bar closed, until the staff wanted to go home. And that's kind of where the whole thing started from. And then since then, they've made up this whole backstory that they were actually around in 1968 and started as this trio. And then one of them had a heart attack. And while he was in the hospital, Black Sabbath stole all their music and became a heavy <laughs> and created heavy metal from their jazz album. So it's really, I mean, the backstory is hilarious. It reminded me so much of like Casbah Voxed or, um, you know, Spinal Tap type thing. But they're actually 
musicians and they actually have put out two albums now i think they're um, actually musicians they're, i mean they're actually like real but they're not like, like a actual, sucker from like, vermont <laughs> they're from they're from like you know about, like he's in black sabbath so it's like it's his band like doing it so it's just kind of they're not like a knockoff or something it was so so is it, is it like is it like uh i i guess it's bass drums and guitar is it like straight up yeah that oh, kind yeah. of jazz okay. oh yeah Oh yeah, and listen to it. <laughs> that kind of jazz. It is. It's so funny because you can you can sort of recognize the songs in there, right? But not fully because it's almost like it's not like a straight jazz transformation of the song, but it's in there. And again, like they have backstories to like you know the song was originally called Salad Bloody Salad or instead of Sabbath Bloody Sabbath, and then like <laughs> Ironing Man was like this whole different song about he was tells this whole story about wanting to write a song about this guy ironing and it became this whole thing and the record label wanted it shorter so it went from ironing man and from dick or, or dickies or whatever or Derek, the ironing man into iron man it's like really funny they really do a funny job of creating this world that they live in and then actually playing awesome music so it's very cool we'll put a link in the in the thing today uh down below and you guys can check it out and read about them and check out some of their shows on their website and stuff it's very cool so what what is up with bands and Sabbath, because we have Max Sabbath, who T and I unfortunately <laughs> did not see you do Sabbath songs dressed up like the McDonald's character. Fast food characters. Yes, exactly. I I think Sabbath just leans itself into these funny ch Absurd. characters or like, yeah, absurdities to come out of it. And 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 Ozzy and the, and, and the band seems cool with it. Like they seem very on board with all of it. Like I said, one of the guys is in Sabbath in this one, but the same thing with the other one, like they've met him before and Ozzy's given them the, his blessing as well. So it's, it's fun that the band is cool with that. And it's very fun that these other I bands creativity wise do it. And yes, if you have not checked out Max Sabbath, I highly, it is a fun as hell show to go to live there. <laughs> they put on a great show. Were you guys black Sabbath fans like originally? Not oh, yeah. until not until really college, late high school, college. When I got into college, I had some friends that were heavy Sabbath fans, and that really kind of got me into it. And then you started to open up and realize, holy shit, th this was not what I thought it was. Like they're yeah. damn good. Like it's yeah. it's really good. And then you start watching some of their live shows, which again, so much Sabbath right now. Somebody posted last night on mm -hmm. um, Twitter, you know, about this unknown band that opened for Sabbath and it was Van Halen. And it's like this whole thing of Eddie doing eruption and then going into, you really got me now. And I was like, can you imagine going in to see this, like as an opening act, you're like, who the hell is Van Halen? What they're open for like the band I want to see. And then they, you see that and you're like, holy shit, I just saw early Van Halen and Sabbath on one bill. That's crazy. insanity. Like what? Well, so when I, yeah. when I was very young, um, Woolworths, used to sell tapes like dollar 99 tapes and they were cutouts and off brands it wasn't really black sabbath label somebody else just put a tape out and i got paranoid was one of the ones i stole because yeah, i was doing my part by stealing them because they had stolen it right. and, uh, <laughs> right. nice. and, i will um, say tim to your point though when i was younger like definitely early on you know all you really knew was ozzy biting the bat's head off and like heavy metal and like satanistic shit and stuff like that so you're always kind of like what is this band like what is this all about and like you know the smokers and the stoners were the ones that really listened to them and like you're always kind of like i don't know i kind of dabble more in like classic rock and the dead and that side of that and not like the classic rock heavy metal side of that but then like i said once you kind of grow and your musical taste expands and then you get into it, you're like, holy shit what have i been missing my whole life like this is rock and roll to the core yeah, yeah i did the opposite i went through the heavy metal or, or like 70s rock early metal into heavy metal first and then later found the hippity dippity shit <laughs> right like for like the, you know like sixth seventh you know young kid fifth sixth seventh grade up through high school i was like wearing black t-shirts and like chains and you know what i mean like right. black Nobody Sabbath and it. zeppelin and rage and like all this shit and then my brother plays fish and i'm like the next day i'm wearing tie dyes i was like fuck it You're like <laughs> i, I found really my back. tribe i found my tribe <laughs> well i i loved you know what it is i loved the music i still do I, and parent it's funny you mentioned that paranoid was the first thing i heard too and i instantly fell in love with it and i loved the people too but it was just it got almost like i don't know maybe it's my own experience but it was like there was like so much effort put into that look and like the whole vibe and you know what i mean there was like but, a whole but, fakeness yeah. around it that just felt like at least in my experience, and this was obviously not in the 70s. This was right. in the early 2000s or late 90s. So I was like, 
I don't the, know. the beautiful thing about that album, though, is beyond, you know, you buy it for the hits. You want to hear Iron Man. You want to hear Paranoid. You want to hear Warpigs. But then you keep listening to it and you get Rat Salad and you get Hand of Doom. I mean, Hand incredible. of Doom has to be one of the most, one of the greatest songs ever written about addiction. I mean, it puts you inside of what someone's going through. That's the Mike, thing, Kevin. Like, you uh, know the big right. songs, but when you kind of get into it and dig into it, you're like, holy shit, like, there's some yeah there, it's 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 not just all that it's there's some good shit in there so yeah it's it's fun and again like seeing it expand out into these other funny ventures and these other things just speaks to how good the music actually is and what you can do with it yeah. i'm sure they get their cut well yeah because he's in it too and i mean they go along with it you know if you watch this whole little mockumentary they did on it which again i'll long, post a link as long as the below. check clears right it's long yeah exactly Exactly. I think that could Always. be Bobby. That could be Bobby's middle name sometimes. There was your transition. Always... There was I know. Transition. I was just going to say, there we go. <laughs> All right, we could transition. I was just going to say, I, obviously, you always had the, gave me the impression of being like, having like a good personality and just going with shit. Like, and honestly, Sharon's yeah. the one that's probably like, Where's my check? Ozzy's probably like, yeah, go, cool. you know, fucking do exactly. it. <laughs> and that's Sharon's funny. like, that That's check? funny. That's funny. That, exactly. You know, <laughs> Uh, she's like we need to get paid for this Oz. <laughs> yeah exactly be we'll have my people call 30 percent of your gross <laughs> thank you uh, bobby just did a thing in harlem uh that was recently he, right he, a jazz thing kev why don't had, you tell us about they, this david murray who is a saxophone player who back in the 90s used to do a quintet that played dead tunes yeah. and um the drummer from the Rolling Stones, I guess, is who's playing now. He's, I think, the one who formed the band. And there was a bass player, and I don't have his name in front of me, so I feel it like was it awesome, am. by the way. And that right. Love Light at the end, which is the yeah. best song that they played, because everything else oh, is I like, like Cole Porter. I, I, the opening tune, they did a Cole Porter tune, and I like it because I've never heard Bobby sing it. And, and it was and decent, yeah, exactly. But then, man, that those those next two, that West LA fadeaway and that bird song, are like if you think dead and slow is slow, this was like a snail's pace. And I even told you, Kevin, I was like, I, it, I feel like it worked. It, it worked with the saxophone and the. It worked once you got to that part. Bobby singing it was almost like a poetry reading, and then the music came in. <laughs> the saxophone sounded great in bird song. I will say that, and the love light he actually picked. I think he saved it all for the end and had this leftover energy so he could really give it to love light because love light picked up the pace and there's a great little bass solo in there that that guy lays down the drums go off a little bit and the horn section is just fantastic on that love light like sounds so good so yeah we'll put the link down below for the article and then in the article Bob, is the Bobby, embedded video i tell you what though bobby looks good and he has yes. become such the band leader if you watch the video of it he's like looking over you know holding his hand up and I, I often wonder if there's like a powwow beforehand. All right, these are my hand signals. Back to the top. You solo's yours, you know, whatever. I mean, I think that's all pretty like Bob musicians that here. have gigged and stuff. I think it's like uh intuitive, right? Is right. that the Bobby word doesn't use in ear, I don't think. Have, yeah. do we know if he does or not? I don't I've never seen him with a second mic talking intel. I got I got like, him just... a bitch for a second about jam bass. Can I bitch about jam bass? You can. This, I got triggered like a motherfucker when I was reading this article. I, by the way, I agree with everything you guys are saying. It's great. Well, they list. This is how it starts. Andy Khan. I'm calling you out, Andy. I know you listen. Grateful Dead slash Dead and Company guitarist Bob Weir was among. Do you really need to say Dead and Company's guitarist? <laughs> like, what the yes. fuck is that nonsense? Think of all this. Tickets didn't come. They sold all the people they brought into the fold. There's a lot of younger folks that would who be discovered... like, that'd be, I don't know, man. Oh, the... More egregious is that they say they call West LA fade away weird song and it was weird a song. Garcia Otter competition. I, exactly. I thought that same thing, Kev. I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> like, yes, the way he's that threw me it. out. That threw me out of the whole article. I agree. So. That that was the worst part. And I will say, like, they're giving him too much credit for like now owning the song the way he sings it now, and it's not his. <laughs> like, I agree. That was a little egregious for sure. But I mean. Bobby, to your point, Kev, he sounded, he, he's, you know, he's doing what he loves. So God bless him for being up there and playing and doing it. And, and never know where I was, up. <laughs> I was listening to a uh, serious today on the way to get some lunch and they were playing, you know, the did this day in dead history. And it was from four, three 88 and, uh, in Hartford, I think. And 
Jerry's voice was shot that night. And I mean, the Althea is rough, rough. So like, there's a lot of Bobby. There's a, there's a promised land. There's a little red rooster. There was a um, greatest story. Bobby sounded great though. Like he really picked up the slack that night. I mean, Jerry came back for the cold. He was rain in himself. his forties. He was in his and prime. Fucking. Cr- I mean, Jerry, Jerry did crush the cold rain and snow and in, in that thing. But I mean, I, it was, I, listening to it, I was like, wow, man, like poor Jerry was like, give me some hot tea. And Bobby's like, I got this. I got it. I got it. And he, well, he there's, dominated. There's, that, there's one show back in 78. That's all weird tunes. Cause uh, Garcia had laryngitis. It is, and this is exactly what it sounds like too. Like ten years later, right? Like eighty-eight, yeah. seventy-eight. Every ten years, Jerry Jerry loses his voice. If we had made it to ninety-eight, change. it would have happened again. Yep. Mm. All right. So I want to tell a quick to set up this AI story. I want to tell yes. a quick thing that maybe this is not news to people, but my the guitar player I jam with took some recordings that we did. They were they were like fine. They weren't great, not shitty, but. You know, just hey, put your phone in the studio. Hugh? We're around you playing. mean Hugh? Hugh, yeah. yeah. Um, and and I was like, oh, cool, nice recording. He sent it to me like a couple days later, and it sounded like the Beatles were covering us. Like literally, the room, the audio, the the sound effects, the voice was Lennon. Like the harmonies were Lennon and McCartney. And I was like, how the fuck did you do that? And he's in a Beatles <laughs> tribute band, so I was like. Oh, did you guys take your other band and like cover this song or whatever? And he's like, no, there's this AI program where you could put in commands and functions and it take and he can isolate tracks, right? Which that's the valuable part of it. Like if you don't have separate tracks, it used to be you could never like isolate it very easily. You could isolate drums, you could isolate, you know, guitar, but then you can change the timber and the quality of it to make it sound like all of these different artists. So it fucking blew my mind, but I thought it was just like a party trick. Then I saw this article that I think, Kev, you brought up was about all these musicians and artists coming together in an open letter uh, on this lawsuit that they're going to bring. Or I don't think it's a lawsuit yet. Right. I think it's it's a it's, it's a, a third warning that, that we will. We have lawyers. We have money behind us right now because you aren't big enough to have taken all our money. yet. <laughs> and, it, and it brings up a really interesting conversation. And I, I mean, obviously, we're artist friendly here. I think everybody's going to be like, yeah, fucking we're with them. But like. It, I didn't realize the technology was that good where you can literally take a shitty recording and turn it into sounding just like that band. You know, it's a fucking crazy how uh, advanced the technology's gotten. It's scary. Thanks, I mean, it's scary to that point. I mean, it's cool, like you were saying, and there is use for it. But once you start crossing over that usefulness into these gray areas of this, well, not like being able to do that and and you know sooner or later even like you know the george carlin thing that his his estate just settled that deal with like having his you know that whole thing go through so like there's a i think there's going to be a lot of you know combining like the holograms with the ai and like then we'll get to buy Zap tickets will be to back a right, new right. Song. right Ticketmaster will start selling tickets to a like fake band night of an ai produced and then Beatles blaming show. the band for taking all the cut right. but they own the fucking they own the, right, exactly. <laughs> well uh, no what, circle. what they wrote what they wrote in the letter was cease the use of artificial intelligence to infringe upon and devalue the rights of human artists yeah because ai so. does not create art it reuses repurposes and redistributes the art it mm. takes samples off of the internet, right? You it won't organically create right. the music. It has to learn and repurposes and replicates off of what it knows, absorbs or learns, what it takes off of the internet. There's massive scrubs of whatever it is, but pictures, maybe, videos, music, and that's and how that it learns to do it. That goes with everything, with like scripts, with film, with editing, with all of that. All of that is the same kind of thing, right? Like it has well, to it, because it has to learn through learning all this other stuff, so it has all. So it's not original, right? But like but that. how about this? Remember, at one point, photography didn't exist, and then photography existed, and you had you know a work of art in an age of mechanical reproduction. You could take right. a picture of the Mona Lisa and sell that as a work of art in its own. Well, right. we've moved on now to the work of art in the age of digital reproduction, and you maybe we need to reevaluate what a work of art is. Well, I think the problem is, is who's getting, how does the artist get paid? It's the about original? the money. It's the money, right? Well, it is because if it's not, 
If it's not, you start running into the Ticketmaster problem and the Spotify problem and these issues where like you're taking the original and then like I'm putting this out there, but I'm not getting paid for it. And all these other people are sampling it and using it and, and taking what I created and turning it into sure turning it, it into their the art. Pool. It dilutes the royalty pool too because they can crank these things out. Right. So. Right. So my my, my 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 apocalyptic vision of music in the next five years is that incidental music and movies and commercials will all be done by AI. So that's going to be taken out of your bag of tricks that you have as a musician, right? Which to is make a living, and that's where the vast majority of musicians make their money on, right? It's it's not going to. I don't think it's really going to hit the top one percent of musicians as hardly, like as much, right? Like I think. Trey is going to still be fucking Trey and like he'll survive. But I have lots of friends that are musicians that do. They work on commercials. They work on video games. They work on fucking mm -hmm. independent films it, it or takes, fucking they whatever. Say it takes, they say it takes at least 10 shows of a tour to break even. So you have to at least do 14 shows to pay the rent for the month, which means you're gone for three weeks. No, I'm not even out talking about month. touring musicians. I'm right, talking yeah. about like. It's right, weird to say like people. blue collar, but like right, you know, yeah. like like fucking journeyman, journeyman right. musician. Well, right. I'll give you, I'll give you a story like from my side of the industry, like voiceover talent, right? Like back in the day, voiceover talent used to drive around, like have a limo that would drive to each studio or each network to do his voiceover thing, right? And then that sort of got replaced with, oh, I can do it at home, and like you'd call them and direct them over the phone and like have them do it over the phone or whatever, and now they're totally going to get taken out of the picture and it's just going to be AI voices and AI things. So like you've gone from like these guys making millions of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars to a couple of thousand dollars nothing. to nothing. <laughs> so it, it definitely you invested your money in AI. Would it be hypocritical <laughs> for us to use AI to produce the Wookiee awards? Cause I'm just looking at this that... mountain of work I have to do in the next couple of weeks. And I'm like, Maybe they're maybe they're onto something. <laughs> maybe we can have AI take care of it. Right? Is, where do I get in touch with this AI? How do I get them to work for me? You just you need to just call him, Mister AI. Well, I, I, I got to get a Neuralink so they could just take my thoughts gonna, and create it directly. Play I use a guy on. I use an I use an oh, AI I voice on my podcast because I didn't want to be introducing the episode and then also be the person Why, saying hey man, welcome back people to the tune in to kev hogan for your awesome accent you're gonna deprive them of that they want your accent that's the main that's why they even watch book plus people have told me that they're like hey that baltimore a lot of people think philly for some reason i guess they don't know philly accents they're like that baltimore philly guy i like his accent yeah, you go back and watch the old slogans, Kev. I mean, that's the beauty of them—the the, the chops and the the pronunciations of everything. Like, that's it. You should be your own VO guy. I did have an idea for a bit months ago, and I never figured it out or took the initiative. So, but I was going to figure out a way to replicate, like, feed AI all of our shows and replicate Kev's voice, so I could like write things for him to say. And then, like, just play clips of him saying, like, whatever crazy you do. Shit. <laughs> and be like, oh, Kev, you remember when you said this? Like, I didn't say that. See, it whatever you do, how hard you it would be to AI. write something outlandish that's more outlandish than what Kev actually says. Like, <laughs> that I would deny saying. Right. He just feed it his Sean Connery impersonation, his Kermit the Frog, and the way he says water. And that's all you need. <laughs> or war. All right, let's make a voice. <laughs> <laughs> the Empire is always in peril. Oh, See, you man. can change up your voice. And that's, I used to have my boss would always do scratch for you. And it was so funny listening to him because he'd be like, three, two, one. And then, <laughs> and then say it in his voice. And you're like, where did this, where, where did that come from? Like, who are you? You're like, what happened? Welcome you back. Like exactly. See, exactly. Kev, you think we should use AI VO? AI we VO? should. Sure. AI? Sure. I feel like a hypocrite though. Cause I'm just like, oh. but no, I mean, who gives a shit? You'd be at the forefront of a new art. No, Andy's our VO guy, though. I like I like his uh, voiceover. I don't know. Anyway, Ben got a new band. That's exciting. I'm a DJ, I mean, Will DJ Williams got a new drummer. <laughs> is that the same band? <laughs> um, DJ Williams is a friend. I would call him a friend. I've spoken to him quite a few times. He's a fantastic guitar player. Used to kick around R Richmond, now lives in Denver. Played with Carl Denson for 10, 12 years, something like that. And he's put out a couple solo albums, Soldier of Love and 
It's the other one by way of RVA, Richmond, Virginia, and very Curtis Mayfield. I think Tim listened to a little bit, but he just announced yeah. he's doing a summer tour, and this is where Ben is going to hit the road again, I guess. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I'm not super well caught up on his catalog, but I tried to cram when I saw this as much as I could. And my very preliminary initial instinct is that, A, this is a great fit for Ben, right? Like, it's not super jammy, space cadet. It's a lot of... I think Curtis and, Mayfield in the 70s. Right, exactly. And then also, it has to be a huge vote of confidence for him because that kind of music is very, very dependent and reliant on a touch. That's what I call it. Describe it as like there's a touch or a feel in the drums. Like it's not necessarily hard patterns, but it's very difficult. I think to like really give it that feel that it needs for the music to work and for DJ to be like, listen to Ben and, and I'm just sure there was some sort of audition or at least a, a vibe check, you know, like, Hey, let's go play, have a session. So it, which I'm not surprised. I mean, Ben was a great drummer, is a great drummer, right? He's not gone. He sat in with Humphreys, who was fucking fantastic. So I'm and actually really Ella excited Funk. to hear this. He had Ella Funk or whatever that band that he's played with before. I think they played Park City and somewhere else the other weekend in yeah. Connecticut, New York, maybe. But yeah, this is a good thing. I hope it stays together. I hope it becomes a real thing because DJ's, <clears throat> at one point, he had two bands, uh, Shots Fired, and then he had his other band. Uh, the DJ Williams project, but they played the same songs. And then when he left Carl Dent and he moved to Denver, his last album, he played everything himself. So it'll be interesting how these three guys come in and fill in the bass and the keyboards and the drums that he had recorded before. So did they announce the tour? So I know that they announced a summer tour, but did they actually put out dates? I did not see the dates on DJ's page. I sent him a message earlier. Yeah. So well, maybe he could come on live and talk about it. Or Ben he might be able to. Them. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, probably what? shouldn't talk about that live until we figure it out. Um, no, I'm listen. I think this is great. I think it's I a win-win it. for everybody. It's going to be it's, a must-see. It's going to be a must-see for people. Yeah, if you like that kind of music, for sure. Or and I'm, I'm curious, Tim, to that point, how many Goose fans will transition into you know, like still follow him, like still feel like. Oh, let's check him out, or let's go see this. Or does because... it become persona non grata? Right, exactly. Or are they like, "Fuck that guy, he's out of the band." Like, you know no. what I mean? Like, I'm I mean, I don't. Thing. I'm not an expert. I'm not like a fucking Ryan or something. But like, my impression from what I've seen, at least the people I know, is that people are happy. You know, are like happy with the direction of the band, and like they love Cot. But there, I don't see a lot of hostility towards Ben. I think, I think honestly, yeah. people are like. Let's just look the other way. Like it looked like it was an <laughs> right. ugly situation. We don't want to get into it. Don't tell us. Like mommy and daddy are fighting. Like right. we love you, bro. Right. Like I don't want to look at that. And then, but you're hoping then on that same note that they're like, oh, good for him. He's in this new band. Let's go check it out, or let's go see what he's up to these days, or how that's going for him. You know. So good for him. And I think, yeah, hopefully it's it's something that people will check out and and cross over, not just. DJ's fans and things like that that like that music and, and start following it, but hopefully he gets some. Of that it's definitely out. not goose. It's definitely not right. goose. Um, the the lyrics deal with different things. You know, goose can be more metaphysical. You know, DJ's pretty straight on, but you should find his studio cuts, anything live he's done. If you haven't but seen I think, him, I think the <laughs> entry is easier going from goose to that the music I heard then, oh, like yeah. like a <clears throat> Spafford or Fish or like <clears throat> any of the other right. Like I think goose is a little closer like an iteration closer i don't know maybe not all the fans but i could definitely see some fans coming over and and enjoying it I'm yeah and i think i think it's you know i don't want to say like it's not a step down to follow it but it's like it's on that lower level of goose so it's easier to kind of go down to listen to that than trying to get people from that level to go up and get into goose i think so i think it'll yeah be it's cool. definitely a step down from goose i don't i mean that's not like being mean but I mean, not, like, right not being mean but like level like just the way in ticket sales and reach, well, just in mean? like the whole thing, like Goose. Right before Ben left Goose, they had just sold out Hampton and did a European tour. DJ's not right. selling. I mean, he's a great musician and it's a great band, but oh, like, right, yeah, yeah, he's, he's not, not at that those, level. So it's those it's, numbers, sure, it's cheaper, right? It's an easier. But thing I tell you what, it's something. Out. What he's doing, if this band gels and they stick with him for the long haul. I think it's something that could in three, four years be built up to where you're playing the 5,000 seat places. 
Yeah. And that would be great. I mean, that would be great to see, right? Like, that would be another That's sweet, perfect size. Sweet. You yeah. don't need to play Hampton. I mean, it's cool. And it, we all love going to see fish at these huge places. But you get up to 5,000. That's a lot of people. And you lose the intimacy. And you're going back to the top thing we talked about. Then you're starting to get into that ticket sales mess where you're charging more and more fees. And you're not you have to pay more people. people. You have right. to have more and, crew. And you're it's out of dragon that eating where you it's easy for fans just more to go Morris. get tickets from the box office or from Dice or something like that and keep it on that lower end, which is great. Right. Yeah. I, I heard that there's going to be something special coming up on Sunday night after Goose at the Cap. Mm, are you segueing to our after shows? Oh, I'm segueing like a hell yeah, you are. I'm He's feeling like, really chill oh. right now. <laughs> no, I I had post surgery. I'm like I got a nice cocktail of uh, chillness, so <laughs> I'm just like, all right, let's fucking segue. <laughs> I'm with you, Kev. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So I think this is all I'm gonna say about it. I'm not going in with the intention of shitting on the shows, but I'm not also going in with the intention of fluffing and being like, that was the greatest shit ever. I think this is an opportunity since it's stuff that I'm pseudo adjacently familiar with, but not like emotionally invested to the point I am like with fish that I, I think it's going to be interesting to have a like very honest, open, real recap. We're also bringing in some goose experts to fill in like, you know, play Kev's you role. Buried the headline. With, like, the history. <laughs> you buried the headline. That's okay, man. I told you. Because, I'm because Tuesday night, I'm going to be with T listening to Merryweather from 2000 Fish. And then Wednesday night, T and I are going to be here having another stream of thought ride. I might be here world. Wednesday night, actually, depending <laughs> right. on how the first three goose shows. I might, I might be like, three's enough. Well, I'm Greg, Greg out, Knight right. will be here. So I'm like, Greg, or you take the show. Be, or you'll be so into it that you're like, I cannot miss another. I got to see this show and see how they write. I hope they do like, Redbird again. Right, exactly. And I'm going to let the kids do their thing, have substitute teacher night and do their thing again. And let Kevin and I just run the show on our own again. <laughs> hey, man, I trust you guys. I never worry for a second yeah, when you be, guys are running the show. Great. If, if you go back and watch that Greg Sarah fan from earlier, it's. And he, if you like the Disco Biscuits or if you want, if you want an entry into them, he does a great job of breaking it down and. You know, it, it can be very daunting to look at a Disco Biscuits and to look at a set list with the backwards arrows and all that. It's so, all very daunting. Yeah, that, that's the world we're in. Techno Jam. Like, I would much rather talk Goose than Disco Biscuits. I'm sorry. I, just I, well, I just I just tried to turn Goose at the Cap into a commercial and transfer. Yeah, right you, into we got to get you off the segways. You're, you're going too. So, um. My take on Disco Biscuits, not that anybody gives a fuck, but we're here <laughs> to do it. I think live, like at a show, I would enjoy that probably more. But like sitting home, breaking it down and like couch touring, it's real. It's hard for me. I, I much rather listen to like Fish or Goose or something. Well, you say that, but I mean, if you can get through not having a seizure with the lights and the lasers at a Disco Biscuit show and then get through the shitty fucking DJ techno. I'm curious how many of their fans are actually. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> Jesus Dude, Christ. I've been dragged to so many other shows. Jesus, like wrong back, opinions. Back in the 90s. And don't <laughs> let me go off on a rant here because I will. Uh, <laughs> I'm so upset. When I was cleaning out our database, like all our old shit, I found the bumper I made for you, T Strong Opinions. And it was so fucking funny because it was you walking on the beach and looking all like, you know, stoic. And it's like piano music. It was like T Strong Opinions. I wish I fucking published it. Because it's exactly, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll rip a rant here on them. I mean, I've been to a few of their shows, especially back in the day, what, late 90s, early 2000s. And I was just like, what is this madness? And now it's funny to see them getting where they are and getting this. And I'm like, it's still the same crap. I'm sorry. It's still the same crap. But I'm curious how many of their fans are, are crossovers into that other area of techno. Because, I mean, I love, I used to go to Coachella all the time. I love, like, Chemical Bros. I love that kind of music. I do like to go dance and raves and sometimes and shit. But I can't combine my love of jam with my love of that into one kind of band and go see that. It just, it's insane. You gotta like, adjust your cocktail of drugs. You gotta <laughs> tweak it. I know you joked about that. You're like, you need more drugs. I was like, yeah, I, I wish I could do more drugs every day. <laughs> like y y every day. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I feel like maybe those days are behind. Like it's hard to get right. 
at this age to go back and be like, yeah, let me dive into this world. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. For the young kids or whatever. Great. You know, it's kind of like the, I almost feel like it's like the DJ Gobi or Giobi or whatever type, type thing in that vein of like, okay, let's test hmm. this out. Let's see what this is like. And I guess if that's your thing, like the disco biscuits, you can get into that. But I, I tell you what, I tell you what, I it is, a, it is a very difficult thing to write a rock opera, a space opera, they call it. And they have an outside lyricist working with them. Every one of the songs can stand on their own. I think they did a fantastic job, probably better than that Pete Townsend guy ever did, because there's a lot of filler on his rock operas. Wow. And you're saying the Disco Biscuits album is better than like Tommy or Quadro? Tommy, yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Shots Damn. fire. Holy shit. <laughs> oh, I, we must. Yeah, we're within 10 minutes. We're getting to the point of the show where Kev tries to trigger me. <laughs> Holy shit, Kim. <laughs> That's getting Not clipped out of the hill. Not a fan <laughs> of the hill. I, I just feel like they really nailed it for, for what it is as an art form. It, it is. There's art form again. It really stands up. And if you have a half hour, go watch the whole movie that they put out. It's only 30 minutes long with all the animation. Don't tell me what really to do. Is it, is it better I mean, than I the goose? Will. Is it better than the goose? Oh my god, a hundred times better. Hundred. They they knocked it out of this park with this project. Really, even if it isn't your thing and you wouldn't go see them, they get props because they knocked it out of the park. They did a great job. Yeah. No, it's like I'm... the fish bracket, just like on the fish bracket. A great job. Oh well, hold on. I I, I always have like one more thought. And every know, time get, get he jumps right ahead, ahead. man, he's just he's running through shit. Like, don't even stop him. <laughs> like, Fuck your thoughts. We're moving ahead. <laughs> I wanted to say, and I always feel bad bringing it back and derailing it because the points aren't that good. But I, I don't know. Bring it uh, out. Fun. Go back. I like, I like in general seeing. I don't like. No, I like seeing the success and the positive energy when behind artists. Right. Like I use I don't know. There's like a weird thing that like when you see bands or artists having some success, like there's some group of people that like comes up with an excuse to like shit on people's parade or like get angry at the fans or whatever. But I'm like the opposite. I get even if I don't love the art, I just love the the positive passion being circulated around. Right. Like the whole goose momentum, even if yeah. you hate the band, just admire and enjoy that and the same thing the like disco biscuits are going through this like renaissance right now their fans are enjoying the shit out of it there's a really positive dialogue Spafford? Spafford Spafford is another one, yeah. since, mm -hmm. since they got the new keyboard player yeah so, i like, agree i mean i'm enjoying and, that aspect of it yeah and they, they look like they're having fun their fans are really into it it's a good thing to see like a renaissance like that is really cool because it's Especially this late in the game, like holy shit! Yeah, that's uh, they've been around forever to so, like have this like sudden momentum shift in this 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 is it's cool. It is cool to see from outside, even if it's not your thing. Like it's not my thing. I can still appreciate it. Well, that was calm. That was PC. I thought you were gonna say even if it's horrible, shitty trash <laughs> echo music. Even if it fucking sucks, you can enjoy it from a distance. <laughs> fucking terrible. Yeah. Um. No. Good for them. I'm happy for them. I Are you going to Coachella? SC, I am not going this year. I haven't been for a couple of years. My wife really wants to go. She never went. I went for like five years, six years straight, and it was some of the but best. You time did it right. Life. You yeah. rented a crib, didn't you? We got yeah, we got a sweet pad and like did the whole thing. And I love. I mean, it's right here, right in Palm Springs. Like God, I wish Fish would come back to India so bad. I mean, it was just a, it's a perfect weekend. You really, but yeah, I haven't gone in a while. And I the lineup sort of changed so much, you know. Like I don't even I don't even know have the headliners anymore. Or half the undercards. I used to like just going for the undercards because that was where you'd find new music or see bands like Florence and the Machine playing in the tent. The first year she played there was. Were you there when like, Steely Dan cool played? Thing. No, no. But see, I Paul love that year. I will say Paul McCartney. That was I went. Paul McCartney was like my third year there, or something like that, and that was the best set i've ever seen and thanks to him he's the reason why now they can push the late night show the late night saturday nights because he wouldn't stop playing he just he had like four encores and he just kept coming back out and they turn the lights on and he walks back on on stage like he's not done yet <laughs> it was like it was awesome like geez like i'm do you know who i am <laughs> and that was before they really started getting all the older acts into it he was like the first one of those older acts it was always like and i mean there was always Man, some cool I mean, they had written a, a thousand great songs. He could go out and he could do an all night set like Fish did. He could do a full day at Coachella. Like he could just right. do a whole Sunday show for himself, and you'd be and you'd love it. Like you'd be a totally immortalized. But you'd be like, "Yes, I am in. Fantastic. I saw it all. I saw it all. Yeah. 
Exactly. I love when he breaks out Helter Skelter. He still does Helter Skelter, and it's louder than the Who ever got. And I mean, he's still be, like, <laughs> look, even like Live and Let Die, the Who. I love your. I love when Kev focuses on like one band that he just can't stand, or like one person or something that he just can't stand, and just keeps <laughs> going so at it. Weird. That, I've never met anybody that was like passionately hate like hating of the Who. <laughs> I'm not, I my favorite Who is. The About Face and the uh, Face Dancers album. The Face Dancers and Hard Times with I Athena just, and Don't Let Go the Coat. I love that. Rock. And his all the, best, like. all the Best Cowboys Have Chinese Eyes. That's a great album. Because he doesn't like the Stones either, right? You right. Like, bitch about very, the Stones. I, I like some Stones. Side 2 of Tattoo You is probably one of the greatest things ever put on vinyl. I just imagine yeah. there's some crazy trauma early in his life and that was like playing on an old... <laughs> Turn I got cable. beat with 45. <laughs> right. Like, like he's getting like whatever. And, and it's just playing in the background. And he's like, oh, all with him was playing. It's, like, right. it's the exact opposite of that scene in Almost Famous where she's like, light a candle and put on the who and you'll see your future, whatever. With Kevin, it was like some it's traumatic so some traumatic incident. <laughs> exactly. He's locked in a closet while the who is playing. He's like, never again. Ah. <laughs> Bad trip or something. Mm -hmm. oh, it's man. a bad trip with that fish bracket. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's been going swimmingly. I was, you know, what always blows my mind is how many people fucking really get upset, like not at like the choices and the voting, but just that it's happening. There's this whole like <laughs> sub like this conversation going on. It's like, oh, fucking. You get subtweeted about it. <laughs> I get sub, dude. There are like <clears throat> dozens and dozens every day subtweets. So people are just like very vicious and very angry that this is a thing. And I'm like, I don't know what Do to you tell know? you. Like, you know what the, that the best way deal. to deal? The best way to deal with that is to feel some empathy towards them because for whatever reason, they're lashing out at you on Twitter. When there's probably something else look that they're you, hurting. Kev. Well, you're so enlightened. Isn't that, hey, Kev, look in the mirror, and isn't that you with the who and some of these other right. bands? Like, look at you. Out of the bands because it's, it's you. Ray Bond, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's but speaking from experience. Tim, you do a good job of saying to people, mute it, like, get, you know, like, yeah. don't, don't. Yeah, I'm not trying to force shit channel. down your throat. I'm just want to, like, I want to encourage right. people to participate because it makes it more fun. Right to have like a a bigger sample, but every single one has fish hashtag fish bracket, so you can mute it. But I don't know. I find it. I wasn't even saying like, oh, woe is me or poor me, because like I don't care. But like I find it funny because I'll just be like doom scrolling for you know. I try not to go on X that much anymore, but like every once in a while I'll go on I'll, and I'll see fish bracket. I'll be like, oh, is that one of ours? And then I'll open it up, and there's this whole like thread of like people jumping on, like talking shit about it. And I'm like, whoa, what the fuck? Where did that come from? Um, I did want to bring up a matchup. I wanted to see what you guys thought about this. It, it was what the ACDC stash because ACDC really should be winning that, especially no. after the especially after the game hinge one. Come on, <laughs> like that's not even what I was going to bring up. Are you guys upset with that outcome? Yes, I am. <clears throat> I'm more I thought upset ACDC about was going to 16. I was more upset about the, and we should use this as a segue, but I don't want to go there yet. But I'm more upset about Riff beating Gaiuti personally. Like, Riff is a great song, but Gaiuti is, come on, people, like mm -hmm. crying out loud. Wait, Rift one? Yeah, that one's, see, that the, the fucked up shitty Gaiutis the last couple of years have tarnished, had, tarnished, tarnished that reputation. It. And I mean, it didn't. It lost fifty three to forty six, right? Like fifty three two to forty six eight. So it wasn't even that close, really. Like that was kind of a blowout, so to speak. And that's really not great. I'm kind of pissed about that. I'll admit. <laughs> I pretty adamantly disagree with you guys on bag, though. Like the the New Year's bag was good, and it's like a classic song. But Stash is fucking a workhorse. There's so so many phenomenal stashes over the years, and like. Recently, like 4.0, even just alone, how many fantastic stashes have we had in the last like three years? More than I'm, we've had fantastic bags. There's been like two really good bags over the last four years, and there's been like eight or nine 
insanely you're good stashes. Talking, you're looking at it like through that lens of like fantastic jams and this and that. Like I just bags a great song. Like it does what it does, and it it it's meant to do what it does, and it's fantastic. Stash it's, is a great song though. I'm not saying yeah, that bag's not a good song. I don't think uh, you, you, you're in a different realm for me. Like I just don't. I, I, I don't. ACDC bag is baby making music. <laughs> bow, yeah. bow, 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 yeah. Three chords, bow. four chords. We're in and out. It's you know. and it's one of those fun fish songs where you know all the lyrics and you just sing along and it's a great. They're all cliches. They're all just cliches. It's like a list of cliches. It's so fun totally. that he's strung together. That gets totally. it into this round. I, th- I everything you're saying is the reason that it's ahead of the other. 250 songs that it's ahead of like we're not like it's up in this right. conversation but right. i think the great jam is what gets stashed into the sweet 16 right because mm. that's what this is like they're in the 32 now i think mm-hmm. right? it's the 32 right? yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Day, so day. the conversation what you're saying about bag i agree that's what gets you into the 32 which is an impressive feat right but i think the jam vehicle and those phenomenal isolated memories i think is what elevates you into the sweet 16 yeah but then you can't but then if you look at gaiuti against rift rift doesn't do anything like that rift is basically like well, bad neither, like Gaiuti, neither one of them are huge jam vehicles but yeah, the Gaiuti all... has that story to it and like a great drop back in and like a composed and a huge climax like too that. it's like yeah. the big like right, we've all lived phenomenal we've composition all, we've yeah. all lived the lyrics of rift at one point in our life, yeah. most of us We've have never lived gone the out lyrics with a of pig. Right, like, not who an ugly pig that did ugly a pig. Like, I mean, look at me, man. Like, I'm, uh, <laughs> what are you talking about? I live that shit daily. It's greasy exactly, pig, exactly. And I will say, I I don't even think this had anything. It was not forced at all. Like, I think that by the time Tila came well, on, he stretched out the end a little bit. But that jam was. All of them. Like that had nothing to do with Buck and Tila being slow and coming in. It depends at all. what you mean by force. Cause like I agree that it was manufactured, like it was by design yeah. right. for the logistics, but it didn't sound like not in a negative way. It didn't sound like the jam was they, wrote, they, they, they were it like, We got stretched. 20 minutes, let's ride it. Right. And it wasn't stretched out to like allow her time to come in. By the time that started, they were already at that apex of the song to start like yes rolling and it a little was bit so but... fun they brought her all the way through the crowd yeah the everyone got to, to look at her you know i missed yeah. the kayak on the video from home i didn't hear about that till the next day that there was a kayak for punch yeah he guy. went right yeah he was like right in front of our section too where he went and that was like yeah he was hard I missed to see a lot that. of shit when i was there i was too blissed out <laughs> <laughs> you were no, no, it wasn't like no. What's I was? Oh yeah, no, I was a little fucked. You were up. a little tipsy. Yeah, I saw you. Yeah, you were little, <laughs> yeah you were no, tipsy. you're right. I wasn't driving. I took the train yeah. and I was fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Take no, the train. Take that the train. Good, that good, was so. Good. So, so which one were you going to bring up? The harpoon yeah. matchup? No, well, shit. You're bringing up. I was like, this has been a very non-triggering bracket <laughs> so far, and apparently, you know, I was shocked that uh, Coil beat Piper. I thought that was out, yeah. outlandish. I was like, what the fuck is going yeah. on? I will agree with that too. I was a little shocked at that one and disappointed as well. Like, cause Coil, it's a great song, but is it like Piper? Again, I think Piper gets shorted because there hasn't been a lot of great Pipers lately or whatever. And, and they're these shorter versions of it are like, the we slow have build. Really- if there had been one slow build in the last four years, can if, that be if you could get a initiative? Piper? Like that ACDC bag or like the chalk dust. If we could get one or two of those, I think it would get its name back into that that right. conversation. You know how like people use their influence, like the, the posters and the T-shirts and the social media to like get certain songs played or whatever. Can we like start a grassroots movement to have a slow build brought back? I mean, yes. we know enough people. Right, like start making shirts, sure start like posting online every day about it, get signs well, about we, it. You know, okay, at Mondo Green, we will we'll, we'll, we're gonna have to have signs and somebody there all summer. But I agree. Let's shoot for Mondo. What happened? Sorry, Kev. I didn't mean to, you, you. You you stuttered. That was funny though. <laughs> you got like you got like drawn out. Like, Green, but the thing is, Mondo Green. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have to uh we're gonna have to enlist people all summer on the rail to take in a sign every night and hold it up. So by the time they get to Monday Green, they'll know we're waiting for it. 
Right. I think I think all we have to do is talk to Maggie. Right. <laughs> like, let's just, let's right. just talk to Mags, and we'll 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 get it. Got to come up with that. a cool hashtag too, or something. Totally. Why don't we get AI and bots on it? The X is full <laughs> of bots. Let's just recruit those sex bots. Like whatever, yeah, exactly. it's like pussy and bio. It's like N- nudes people. and bio, slow build Piper. <laughs> yeah, right. Get AI porn pictures to like as clickbait, and then you open it up, and it just give just us slow, slow build, build Piper. Piper. <laughs> Tag the band. Yes. Tag the band. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that's our goal then this year is. And I think Tim, build Piper. to that point, tell anybody who has their run-ins with Trey when they see him and like give him suggestions or like Dude, ask him, hey, you should... why haven't why have you played Shade in forever? Why don't they be like, hey, why don't you, you bring back a slow build Piper? Like that would be. If you fantastic. use your singular opportunity of talking talking to Trey to bring up Shade, fuck off. Seriously, <laughs> like what the fuck? <laughs> yes, no, you're right. Use those opportunities, everybody. We are recruiting you into this movement. We need a slow build Piper. And it is criminal a criminal that we haven't had one. It, it is, is a movement. movement. It, it is. is. I, it's a very I slow want... movement. <laughs> very slow build, slow movement. <laughs> it's like being constipated. It's something <laughs> will happen. All right. All right, Kev. Speaking of constipated, why don't you tell us about your awesome rift take? All right, let, let me preface this by saying that if you look at some albums that have come out, there are no Mike songs on them. At one point, there was, I think, a band thinking that there had to be songs from everybody on every album, or Mike had to have, like, he has a song every night in the first set. And that's why we ended up with Mike songs on this album. Now, if we dropped the Mike songs, or at least dropped Way, and replaced it with maybe Curtain or Runaway Jim that were recorded for the same sessions, I think it would be a much better album. Yeah, I don't think those would fit in there, though. I don't know if you could stick a Jim on that. I like the album to me, like from one through 15, it's like it's so per- it's like chapters in a book. Like it just it works so well. But how does Way fit in there? How does Way is fit fucking in there? perfect? It is, I, it is perfect. Silly- it's silly fish, right? Like it's the silly fish that you need those breakups in there. I mean, I think it's great. And mound, you can't complain about mound. Come on, mound like, is phenomenal. Mound. It, yeah. This take particularly pisses me off because literally, not not any other, but the vast majority of any other Mike song on any other album, you could have gotten one hundred percent agreement from me. I'd be like, yes, you're right. Fuck that song, right? Like Sugar Shack. No, we didn't need that. That really messed this album up. <laughs> But you're gonna to try to convince me that way in mound, oh, the two are your right. Yeah, they fuck up riff, like no. So, way. so T, T, this is what you're cutting out. Um, Walk defends Mike. Thank you. <laughs> That's the headline. <laughs> exactly. But I, I, I agree with him though. I mean, there's very few and far between Mike songs that you can handle or like want to hear or deal with, and these are two of them that I don't mind. And they're and it just so happens. Actually, look this, forward to. I love those songs. And they're on this other flawless album, so I just think it's. I, I think it works with it. I, I agree though. I think there's other Mike songs that you could definitely complain a lot more about. <laughs> See? Yes, exactly. I, I, you know what, the, the line just kills me. It is such, it, it's, it's all, it's very laborious to get to the punchline of that song. <laughs> it's such a fun song too, though. Like the groove it of it, you Six know, pounds, seven pounds. Like it's so fun. Mound, it's mound is fun. Mound, mound is fun. And I can see mound fitting in there more, but you can't see the curtain being that dream instead of way. Yeah, I could see them putting. I could see that, but I wouldn't want to. I, I still think Way is a good. I still think it works on this album where it is. I think it's good for my. This is why Billy would have been like uh, Epitaph, or, or is Epitaph the beginning or the end? Like Epitaph's the end. That's what yeah. You like have I on could soon. Right, I could <laughs> see the curtain being like a bonus track. Right, right. Like I always like thought of dreaming as like a stage you know like you're opening up the stage to like your dream and i feel like the curtain could literally be tied into like this whole story <laughs> <laughs> the legion is shrinking That's now perfect. <laughs> perfect. I'm done. i just blew it all i blew it all the bad riff take on now I appreciate uh, your take. Anyway, so, I mean, I get what you're saying, Kev. I, I get where you're coming from. I understand. I just think Rift is too perfect of an album. Like, they're 
it's just the best that they've done to me and i think those mike songs are part of the reason why they work in this in the context of the album and they're not unbearably awful <laughs> like that is such a like hubris like dickhead thing to do is like take fish is one of the arguably the greatest album and pick it apart and be like you know it really make this good <laughs> <laughs> they're like if, yeah, if they took these songs out that would be now that would be a good album <laughs> they had a better cover art design than the one they have on there i would like it a lot more <laughs> like, well, it already, really it already had cur- it already had curtains on it so did it right oh yeah <laughs> on the window there's a curtain oh the the art i thought i thought i was misremembering the listing the track is i was like that's not on there what are you talking about no they recorded it at the same sessions they recorded that and runaway jim at the same sessions they just didn't make the album and they've never been released as studio versions i like that though i like all the songs that didn't make albums like that i think that's so you ever heard the mike studio from 90 or something like that there was one point where they went in the studio and tried to do mike's groove and it's rough it just doesn't sound right didn't that become part of demand like demand has a so, section yeah. that has a mic a studio mics uh, part in it. no no demand has um uh See? from split open and milk because it was the guy's favorite song who died in the car wreck oh right it's been a long time since i've listened to that demand is fantastic bring it back fantastic. Bring, even bring back the little just part that's it's now that's quirky language that works because it's only a minute and a half and i don't know that out. fish could play that though still that's a really fucking hyper precise playing i mean probably could but it'd be a lot of effort that he probably just doesn't want to do like yeah i'm good we could demand demand but i think the slow build piper is the better yeah, no, we've got a better shot yeah uh, and, and it'd be better like that one just makes sense like why don't they do that because they come into it slow anyway and like there's so much opportunity especially coming out of something for them to really build the piper back out it's just like trey loves to jump jump right it's like kev he just gets so excited he's like i gotta start singing i gotta start singing right. let's go i'm like welcome to wook plus kev's like first on our agenda wait no what's not gonna happen the slow build oh Oh, Wait, Andrew! Keep challenging me. That's only going to motivate us. That's right. We, we need we need you in the in the bubble of positivity over here. That it <laughs> is going to happen. Yeah, it you guys, is. Uh, want to talk Marvel at all? I just wanted to give one thing. X Men ninety seven. I know you guys are a little bit older, but for me, I literally have never. I hate when people say literally, and I hate that I just said it, but. There has not been another adjacent experience that I felt like a studio or an artist or whatever has nailed it more perfectly. Every single expectation I had for this has been exceeded times a thousand. And I, I grew up, I was a whatever, a young kid, 10, 12 years old when X-Men were on originally. And it was like my shit. My parents would just put me in front of the TV on Saturday mornings and I would watch that shit religiously. And it's what got me into comic books. Like, I didn't read comics before that. This was my thing. And so I was, like, a really tall order. It's like, when you're messing with something that, like, saying, you know, holy, mm-hmm. it's like, you're going to fuck it up. Iconic. Hey. Right, iconic, right? And Disney especially has a track record of fucking up things with the nostalgia. I am so unbelievably impressed with this show. They, I just watched the fourth episode, I guess, was today fucking phenomenal i wish they could do this with all of their projects if they hit it as hard as they hit this show it would be back to end game instantly it's pretty amazing to be able to sort of retro retcon sort of that you know what i mean like bring that back because to your point not just disney but a lot of times when you try to bring back nostalgic acts or nostalgia shows or whatever with the remakes or the redos or the whatever they, they always all suck fail. <laughs> they all fail and they're like and and trying to like make something new out of an old ip doesn't work either so the fact that they were able to do this and keep it true to form and crush it the way they have it's it is super impressive i agree with you like it's really and they're taking big swings too they did the inferno storyline they did mojo like spoilers but like honestly if you haven't seen it yet you don't care enough the, for the spoilers but they're not like going in with the slow roll like hey we're going to do this Jean Grey right. story over seven episodes. They're like three episodes in. It's like you got fucking the baby and Mojo and all this shit going on. You're like, fuck yeah, dude. 
Like, I, I don't know. It's great. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, though. Have you guys, the show Equalizer, back from the 80s, mm -hmm. they did it as a movie with Denzel Washington. The movie, the two movies were better than the TV show. And now it comes out with... Denzel Washington is the <laughs> working <thing ever>. <laughs> And now, now it's on TV, and it just doesn't work on TV. Like the it's so, Queen so, Latifah, yeah. You don't, buy, you don't buy her. Yeah, I don't buy it. I don't, I don't either. It's it. so bad, and I love that show, Kev. To your point, like back in the day with the English guy as the equal, it was such yeah. a great like '80s show. It was so well done, and like yes, to redo it. The movie was the movie with Denzel. Like it was taking. The I love IP, Denzel. Isn't there a third it into one something that just else? I mean, that guy's. I thought Amazing. I just saw like Equalizer three. Or yeah, there something. was there was yeah. a third one. Yeah. I haven't seen yeah. it yet. I, I love it that much. I haven't seen the third one. <laughs> but I, I'll I'll watch Denzel in anything. So, right. yeah, he's totally. I I don't know. There's like that generation of like superstars. I feel like I don't know. Maybe I'm getting older, and there are other younger versions. But I just feel like we don't have that right now. Right? Like it's hard to think of like who this current like the denzels or like morgan freeman i don't know there's like a yeah, whole like miss. class of them that was just fucking at a different level than other actors that like you would go to mm. the movie with knowing nothing them. about the story knowing that there was no ip that you were sold on You're like i want to see denzel in this well, movie you know i, I saw so somebody i can think of but i don't know her name is um <laughs> black widow's sister everything she puts out is black Widow's sister. Sister. Florence Pooh. yeah uh, florence, florence Pooh. Florence Pugh. <laughs> she's good. She is yeah, good. Yeah, no, she's and, she and one good. Timmy Timmy Chalamet or whatever is really good, but not to the level of like I'm going to right, see any yeah. movie he like. Yeah, there's lots of great actors out there. Zendaya is good too. I, I'm going through the Dune cast right now because they're all <laughs> fucking good. But but none of them are, at this point for me am I like I'm going to see a movie just for them. And I distinctly remember whatever it was 10, 15 years ago, I would judge a movie. Based who on it? whoever, <clears throat> like whatever the actor, like, at, oh, I fucking love him. But look at look at Denzel's range too. I mean, even back in Glory, when he was in Glory, phenomenal, mm -hmm. right? Like Philadelphia, phenomenal. And then he starts doing the action movies, incredible. What was that like Gettysburg he's movie, fucking remember the Titans? Like mm -hmm. that was fucking fantastic too. Like it's you so could do an action everything. thing, or you could do a coach, or whatever. And then and then even the one the uh, Training Day. I mean, he is a badass motherfucker in Training he's Day. I mean. It's, you know, it's and he plays that that anti hero villain role perfectly, and then he plays the hero you want perfect. Like he's the range for John Q. Like, John Q. With his kid yeah. dying, and he takes over the hospital. That's fit. you totally and believe it. Uh, I yeah, will say his kid, John David yeah. Washington, is pretty damn good too, though. That he's good. Tenant is fantastic. He's great in that. The uh, one before is that, that his like, kid. Yeah, the lead in Tenant. Yeah. Holy shit, I didn't know that. That movie's fucking great, too. Yeah, he's good. He's kind of picked up where his dad loved. He's got some of his dad. I don't not know if he's fully. quite Denzel yet. No, but, <laughs> but he's got some of the chops. Like, he is good. Yeah. Like, some of his roles, he's he's good in. So, Man on Fire. Yeah, there's another great one down there. Uh, wish, I mean, I doubt they're going to, they're definitely not going to do this. But the, when, um, what's his face? Uh, Kang got arrested. There was oh, yeah. There was rumor going around that they could bring in somebody like Denzel to do, like, the Elder Kang or, as, like, the Beyonder. It's like. That would be fucking sweet. Dude, can you imagine? I mean, that would just elevate it all so much, though, too. I mean, I mean Denzel, he's so, he's actually, he has one of my favorite quotes ever. I used to cut a lot of behind the scenes things. And in this one interview, he talks about the process of making movies. And it's my favorite movie quote ever. He's like, What do I love about the process? The process. I was like, Yes, like that's it. Like you have to love every single aspect of making a movie, not just walking on set and saying your lines, right? Like it's everything that goes into it. And, when he said that, I was like, this is why he's the greatest. Like, he just, he gets it. He loves every aspect of it. The process is what makes the movie. And it, uh, that's always just stuck with me. I was like, that's the greatest. I'll never it forget shows, that quote. That kind of passion shows in the work, right? You can't yeah. fake it. You have to come in and just love all of it. Yep. Yeah, it's very cool. I don't know how we got on a whole Denzel love fest. But <laughs> fucking, he deserves the equalizer. It. We, we went from equalizer to Denzel. Yeah. See, this is, this is what happens when Kevin and I are on together. This is you. Welcome to our stream. Like you just, you just. Well, join maybe the we stream. should get rid of set list because this is how it used to be. We we're at the end of the set list, so now we're just like fucking vamping, and it's awesome. Yep. Mm. So good. Right. And we're only twenty minutes. Sunday away. morning. We're looking at Sunday morning. Ten o'clock. Kevin's done. Then, Something right? good's happening. <laughs> does that mean? Does that mean it's time to go? Wrapping us up. Wait, wait, wait. We don't have music. Yeah. We have credits. I always forget what show we're on. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I don't think it would be appropriate to talk about the Silver Surfer stuff tonight. So, uh, we'll we'll save that for save another. That. Maybe Marvel Sunday. Sunday. Stuff. Sunday seems like a good time. To Sunday, talk to Sunday, you Sunday, 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 Sunday. We'll talk Sunday, about Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> All right. See you guys. It's fun having you back, Tim. I love it when the fearsome three things together. Thanks, man. Happy to be back. Bring back some produced wits to appear, I think. What do we bring back? Some of our produced old bits, like slogans, like Pawn Stars. Book Court. Book Court. Sell some Wook Bibles to pay for our. <laughs> Wook Bible? Yeah. Wook yeah, Bible yeah, yeah. for sure. 69, 69.